You're listening to the Activity Strong Executive Edition series on the Bridge the Gap Network. The live webinar series aims to promote, engage, and empower wellness directors and senior living executives to continue the conversation surrounding health and wellness in aging adults. This series is powered by Linked Senior. Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's Activity Strong Executive Edition webinar. My name is Megan McMahon, and I am the Director of Strategic Development here at Link Senior. For today's webinar event, we are providing one free NAB, NCAP, NCCDP, NCTRC, and NZSRDT CEU credit. To be eligible for those CEU credits, you do need to remain on the webinar for the full hour today. At the end of the webinar, I will provide the required post-webinar CEU survey evaluation link in the webinar chat room, and we'll send it by email this afternoon to you, so please be sure to check your spam folder in case it lands there. This CEU survey must be completed by midnight Eastern time this Thursday, and if you do have any questions about our CEU process, please email us at webinars at linksenior.com. CEU certificates will be issued by email before the end of the day on Friday, February, or Friday, April 15th. So today's webinar is about leveraging technology and social media to improve engagement in senior living. And our featured speaker, Tracy Taylor Roberts, president of Sodalis Senior Living is unable to join us today. However, we have an exciting lineup of speakers that will cover her topic and I will introduce them shortly. So as I said, I am the Director of Strategic Development here at Link Senior. I joined the team full-time in November last year and I am proud to be the co-producer of the Activity Strong virtual event series alongside Charles D. Vilmorin, who is the CEO and co-founder of Link Senior. As many of you know, our team believes in a world where people of all ages are respected and valued, and that is why we created our Old People Are, are Cool initiative in 2017. We also believe that activity and life enrichment professionals are incredible and are our industry's unsung heroes, which is why we created the Activity Strong initiative two years ago to acknowledge, educate, and empower each of you. We are excited to be working with so many forward-thinking communities all across the United States and Canada, and we're looking forward to welcoming more communities on board with us in the weeks and months ahead. We are working every day as a team to enhance life in senior communities by building simple and evidence-based technology solutions to bring person-centered experiences to older adults and their care partners. Our technology focuses on engagement, connection, and celebration of individuality. In 2018, we did partner with the Responsive Group in Toronto and Western Oregon University to research our impact on resident engagement with funding for the Center for Aging and Brain Health Innovation. Results from that study showed that our technology increased cognitive functioning and social engagement for residents and decreased aggression in antipsychotic medication use. So here is today's agenda. I am now very happy to introduce our speakers for today's webinar event, starting with Scott Smith, National Director of Resident Programming at Five Star Senior Living, Chris Frankel, who is the Vice President of Engagement of Active Aging at the Arbor Company. And last but not least, Evan Friedkin, who leads business development at Rubric. And I am going to hand it over to Evan now. Thank you, Megan, for having me and, and inviting me to speak along with two amazing people that I have had the privilege with. Scott, I've known for a little bit, uh, and Chris and I met on Friday last week. So I, uh, I am excited to dive into some of the things that we get to see. And, and, um, and Charles and Megan, thank you for having me again and excited to, to go through this. And I, I, 
I was really excited after the conversation with Chris and Scott last Friday. Um, I was sharing with them that it gave me a completely different perspective on a lot of the data that we get to gather because I don't always get to talk to resident engagement and activities directors. Um, I am on the sales and marketing front. So a lot of the information that I'm gathering are before seniors tend to move in. Um, and so to kick it off for, for a high level overview, what I'm gonna, what we're gonna be covering today is uh, the data that we're gathering and how that can really be applied to, to the activities uh, directors and, and really make sure that we're enhancing that customer journey. So trying to take the idea of um, that buyer's journey and continuing it through, not just up until the point that they become a resident, but even after that, uh, once they, they are in the community and they're, they're participating in all of the different things that, that all your communities have to offer. Um, and the way we're going to do it is, is I'm going to do a very high level overview on kind of the way our tool works of how we get the data that we do. Um, just so I can set the stage, but really the bulk of the conversation, which I, I'm most excited to participate in is actually just hearing uh, what Chris and Scott have to say about the trends that we're seeing. Um, and so with that, I'm going to do a quick kind of set it, leveling the ground and kind of what is this? And then I'll do, I'll let Chris and Scott do their brief introductions and then we will dive into the, the fun stuff, which is the data. Um, so to kick it off, we all know that there is a lot of misconceptions and misunderstandings about what senior living actually is. So back in December, Senior Housing News released this article, which was titled Ramping Consumer Confusion Creates Opportunities for Senior Living Innovation. And it's something that we've all talked about. Senior living, we truly believe more people would choose senior living if they actually knew what it was. And as resident engagement folks, my understanding through conversations that I've had is how do we make those lives of the seniors who are living in the communities more meaningful and really become and maintain that level of independence? And that's what you all do day in and day out. And so, but the hard part is we need to get them to be open to the conversation to be able to get in, see what you all have to offer. And so the challenge really is, is how do we take that audience who is confused, concerned, overwhelmed, uh, all of these things that are preventing them from moving forward and taking a next step. And so our background is in what's called uh, medical decision aids. And basically I chose the most slim, uh, not a whole lot of content slide to show you all. So I, I really made sure it was really easy to digest. Um, but I, I just wanna hit on a few areas of kind of what is decision aids. Um, basically what it is, is we need to understand, and this probably sounds like something you all, you all do day in and day out, which is understanding that this is a difficult decision. This is overwhelming. There are, there's a lot of uncertainty. There is, there, there's this unclear kind of guidance that they can go. There's a lot of different resources out there that can ultimately lead to inaction. And so the way what happens when they become so overwhelmed is oftentimes they shut down and will delay the decision, which is not good. If we can get them in there, we can start to help them sooner. And the way you solve it is by decision support, which is we need to understand, we need to, we need to relate to them. We need to uh, really address and, and understand what it is that they need to help move them forward. And so I'm going to share these slides, but if we want to, if we want to sum it up, it's first, we need to know, what do I do? What are the different options that I have available to me? Not only what are the options, but what's important. And if we can pull all those out, then we need to illuminate the path ahead, which is the phrase in medical decision aids. They need to know what's coming down the pike. And if they don't know that, that is too much of a barrier for them to, to, to overcome that. And so the way we do it is by a widget that lives on providers' websites to help these folks who are curious about what senior living is, to help them move down that path in a structured environment. And where I'm going with this is we've got a bunch of different quizzes and surveys and assessments that gather a lot of data. Uh, whether they've choose, chosen to speak to a provider or not, we still get to see kind of who are they, how are they answering those questions. Um, and that's actually what we're going to be covering today and getting some reactions. So that's going to be the fun stuff is 
how is the general population thinking about this topic? What's important to them? What are they looking for? And so the people that I had pulled in to provide the color and those reactions and facilitate the conversation with uh, is Chris Frankel from the Arbor Company. So Chris, thank you for joining me. And thank you for having me. I appreciate it. And Scott Smith from Five Star. Hello. Thanks for having us, Evan. Anytime. Well, I appreciate you both joining and, uh, and I'm excited to start diving into uh, some of this, this data. And so for the, for the folks on the line, it is going to be interactive. So I'm, I've structured this so it's a little bit more family feud style. Uh, where you get to guess the number one chosen response to the questions that we're asking. Um, and so to tee it up, I want to just kind of set the stage on kind of what is this data? Who is it coming from? It is from a hundred, little over a hundred operators, um, which spans across a little over a thousand communities across the country. So it, it's all over. It is U.S. bound. There is no uh, Mexico or Canada in there. It is all U.S. Um, and it is across 75,000 families that have completed this, this assessment. So with that, we are going to dive in to the first question. So the first question we ask uh, is, can you tell us who you're doing this for? Uh, pay no mind to the selection. This is just when I was pulling the screenshots. That's the one that was, that was selected. Um, so in the chat, I, I would love to hear what you all think is the number one selected. And this, this is across the full continuum. So the ILAL memory care and skilled nursing. Um, so I will, I will give, it a, give it a second for people to, to make their guesses. See a lot of moms and dads. Uh, all right, so I, I saw a bunch of mom, dad, husband. Um, Scott Smith, uh, Scott and Chris, any, you, you all have seen this data. When I move on to the next slide, does myself surprise you? A little bit, yeah. honestly, because I mean, when I think of this question, I think a lot of people are looking for mom or dad. I don't, I don't think a lot of people are looking for themselves. Well, and the, and the second piece of it, it, it tells us, uh, it's a great indicator. If you're looking at 49% of people are looking for themselves, that means 49% of our prospective residents are using the internet and using a computer on their own and uh, probably have some expectations when they move in that we have that technology available for them. So that's, that's the first indicator that comes up for me and very surprising. Well, and, and Scott, our conversation on Friday, you were, you were talking about um, the idea of rolling out these, these, these resident surveys um, to, to the folks that are living in five, in five, at the five-star communities. And when you think about, and I, can you talk to me a little bit about the, about the challenge of rolling that out and getting uh, some of that data back that you're ultimately looking for? Yeah. So, um, you know, one of the things that we're really looking to do is to, to understand the resident experience. So when they move into our communities, they're an active part of our community. We try to survey every single resident twice a year and just, you know, what is this work? We improve those types of things. And, and what we're really struggling right now is um, with where do we hold these surveys and how do we make this not such a large lift for our team members in the community? Um, most surveys are kind of created for people between the ages of 16 and kind of 54. Um, so they're all moving towards text-based, um, you know, that's the newest one is, you know, textuous survey or, you know, just internet-based surveys. Um, few people are looking at how do we create surveys that are going to be easy for somebody in their 80s or 90s to take. And so one of the things that we're looking for and, and maybe even struggling a bit with is how do we get resident feedback at a large scale um, in an easy way that doesn't require such a hard lift on our team members. Chris, have you had, do you have any experience and, and how are you thinking about getting that feedback from, from the residents at the Arbor Company? So I agree with Scott, it is hard. It is definitely hard to get residents to complete surveys. Um, you know, a lot of times they'll go in the inbox and they never come back out. So we do try to, you know, tailor something like that sometimes around an event that brings in a big crowd. So maybe we encourage them to come to, you know, like happy hour. That's always, that's always a popular thing. And then that's where we might, you know, really try to get some information. We all, we also use some, you know, some calendar 
platform systems where we can gauge people's happiness in activities and programs, but nothing truly can gauge it like asking those questions. So I agree, there's no way once they're there to really truly see how we're doing with that unless we ask and it takes a lot of time to do that. Cool. And it goes into more than just the questions and the technology. It goes into somebody who maybe has some slight cognitive decline or doesn't understand the wording of the question. Um, so again, data is something that we need to get better at, especially in a life enrichment, but in, in all of senior living in, in gathering accurate data on a large scale when a resident has moved in. I love this tool right here is helping us gather that data uh, before they move in. And the great thing is if we really look at this and take this out of the sales and marketing arena and say, how do we utilize some of the data that Rubric is gathering um, to really make decisions in the community for the residents? Um, that's kind of something that I think there's a connection there that we haven't really seen in the past. Um, we gather so much data before moving, whether we use a tool like Rubric or just in that sales and marketing conversation, that sales conversation, that for many of our communities just kind of goes away and we start from scratch again when we move somebody in. And so really trying to create um, consistency and, you know, get rid of the silos as we hear all the time and say, how do we create this data flow from pre-resident, you know, or just looking to, I've lived in your community for five years, that data should kind of move with that resident. And I was just going to add and making sure that it's all inclusive. We include everybody. So all of the staff knows everything about those residents so that we can provide the best engagement and care along the way. I, I see a lot of people saying that they, they are surprised that so many people are looking for themselves. Um, and so the the next slide that I have is actually, how does that bring, and this gets to Amber's question that I saw in the chat about the cognitive decline a little bit, where what I did here was I, I broke it out as to kind of what is that breakout across the different levels of care? Um, it's not overly surprising that 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 IL and IL focused community does tend to see more folks that are looking for themselves. Um, and then as you start introducing the higher levels of care, so the AL memory care, um, we do start to see that that start to decline a little bit more. Um, but what it ultimately says is that almost a third of people, even with some potential cognitive decline, well, in the memory care focused communities, it's about 12%. Um, so it is, it is definitely less. Um, but this is always a fun slide to see kind of how that breaks out across the different levels of care. So I wanted to provide that uh, for some context. Uh, I did see a question from Helen. Yes, I will share these slides so that you all have access to them. Um, and I will make sure that, and Megan will, will make sure that she gets that, that these get out to everybody. All right, so moving on from the uh, who is taking it, we're moving into the age demographics. Again, just disregard the, uh, the, the selection. Um, in, the, in the chat, do we have guesses on what the number one selected response is here? I'll give it just a, a few seconds. A lot of 76 to 85 seems to be a... All right, so I'm going to move on to the to the answer. It's pretty evenly broken out. Um, when you think about age and kind of who is looking to these communities, is there anything, uh, Chris, that jumps out at you as, well, I, I didn't quite expect that, or is this kind of what you were expecting? It's kind of what I expected, but I think I mean, I'm, I can't speak for Scott or anybody on this call, but I think our, our goal is to get into that 66 to 75 and younger, because I think a lot of times people miss the boat and don't look for senior living until they actually need it. And if we could get them moved in and understand the value of socialization and the value of, you know, building those connections with people and trying new things, we would keep people younger, longer and independent longer. So I think that's where we have to work toward making people understand that, you know, this isn't the end. This is the beginning of something new. You're moving in to learn so much and it's such a better thing. So, you know, at that age group, the older age group, they're coming in because they need us and it's too bad we can't get them to move in before they need us. Yeah, and the, the other thing that stands out to me on this, it's a little different than, you know, 
Chris's take, which I 100% agree with, and I, and I think is is super important that we we really again the, the cognitive and social benefits of moving in um, at a younger age is, is very apparent. Um, but the other thing that stands out to me is this gap, um, and the gap I mean is you're looking at so between 55 to your highest number is kind of 95. Everyone has at least 14 percent which tells me that the age range in our senior living communities is very, very wide. And we've kind of always taken this approach that like, hey, put on you know this kind of music for people or play these kind of games or watch this kind of show or movie. And what we have is we have two or three generations of people now living in senior living and we have to, we have to program accordingly. And so when we look at data and we say, uh, most people's interest in music, their music that they love, kind of comes between the ages of 16 and 23, 24. That's that kind of eight year span there where it's not a one size fits all anymore. It's not go ahead and put on Frank Sinatra and everyone's going to be happy. Um, you, have, you know, you're looking at an age range of 30, you know, 25 to 30 years in many senior living communities. And so, you know, you take your age now and add 25 or 30 years either direction. You know, do I have a lot of in, in common with people of that age? I'm, I'm 42. I don't have a ton in common with a, you know, a 16 or a 17 year old right now. Um, or I don't have a lot in common with a 70 year old. And so this age discrepancy and the consistency across each one of these age groups tells me that our programming has to match that. And we have to offer more than just here's a one size fits all for everyone. I that's definitely it. agree. And I think that's where, sorry, I think that's where, you know, that parallel programming comes in where we can offer, you know, things to get them out, you know, just to encourage them to live life just because they live in a senior living community doesn't mean that life stops, right? So I can, I can join anything I want to and make it more like a resort feel like here it is, here are all the options and I can go to the things that I want and enjoy. Because you're absolutely right. The one size fits all does not fit anymore. Yeah, I, I think what I, again, from, from my perspective, it is, it is very limited since I just get to see the data that gets, gets spit out. I don't actually ever get to see the faces on the other end of these, the, uh, of these numbers. Um, and so what I really enjoyed about the conversation and just love hearing from you both is I always look at these numbers and like, oh yeah, we, I know providers want to get that younger resident. Um, but I never actually fully grasped kind of what is so important about the age breakout until Scott, what you had just said, which is now we have two, three generations all living in the same community. And it really isn't a whole lot of overlap. So it gives me a little bit of color as to what do these numbers actually mean? Um, and I'm, I'm curious from your perspective, do these numbers based on what you know of the ages of the folks that live in your communities, is this representative of, of who ends up moving in? Because a lot of these people who may be younger, maybe are looking for five, six years down the road and maybe not don't move in. So how are you seeing that from on the resident side? Is, is what I'm showing here representative of what's actually in the communities? So what I would say is this, I think this is really important for us as leaders in our communities to protect kind of what our level of care is. And what I mean by that is, you know, we see a lot of kind of people moving into AL that maybe it's more of a skilled nursing. There's always this balancing act between the two. And what we're seeing is there is a demand at that younger age, but when I walk in, does it feel like somewhere I want to live or does it feel very clinical? And so I think a lot of times communities lose that 55 to 65 or even that 66 to 75 because of the feel and the aesthetics of a building sometimes. Or I walk in, I see a lot of people in wheelchairs and walkers and you know, a lot, and it doesn't feel like what I'm ready for. So they turn themselves away from those types of things. And so um, it really, I think that's the part of it is creating that culture in your community, having really strong physical fitness and having very strong you know, therapy programs that can really create an active uh, community um, and you can tell, you walk in different buildings, you kind of tell the acuity level very quickly. Um, sometimes it's parked outside the dining room, right? Like, what does that look like? Do you have a lot of wheelchairs, a lot of walkers? Um, that's a turnoff for people in that younger bracket that a lot of people are going after. Um, and that is not just AL, that's IL as well, is really saying, what is independent living in our, for our brand? And um, really trying to, to make sure that, that your communities match that. And I don't think 
Um, many communities, are, are, they're struggling with this. I think a lot of people are struggling with this. And I would say for, for many communities, you're seeing people moving in in that, that 76 to 85 or more likely even that 86 to 95. So that 66 to 75, that 30% wheel right here, very coveted, but I think they get turned off by some of the things that they see sometimes when they come into a building. I think a lot of it too is perception of oneself because I don't know about you, but when I look in the mirror, I don't see a 51 year old. I still feel like I'm 20. Yeah. So I may have a lot of those deficiencies that I'm seeing when I tour a community, but I don't think of myself that way. So that can be a turnoff too. Yeah. You know, so I think that parallel programming and offering things where anybody can come and participate. And I think that's good too, because they can also put themselves where they feel comfortable. Yeah. And I think long-term, what we're going to probably end up seeing in senior living is a little more niche. Like it's not going to be the one size fits all. Like it's going to be, you're not going to have three, 400 people. It's going to be very, very kind of segmented on what are your interests? Like as we have all of these kind of different options, we all have different interests. You can see senior living following that path long-term where I'm not going for everybody i'm targeting a very specific group so thinking of like hey i'm in a in a market where it'd be really great to have a senior living that was just really focused on people who were into meditation and yoga and that kind of holistic like that could be its own senior living um and they're not going after everyone they're very segmented and i think long term we're going to see more and more of that um overseeing this kind of hey we we offer living you know living for for seniors um so whether that has to do with religious backing or that has to do with your interest, um, you know, age, whatever it may be. Right now we're kind of, hey, what's your, what is your clinical diagnosis and pick based on that? I don't think that's gonna be the answer long-term. All right, moving on to the next question. So everybody gear up to make your predictions. The next question is, let's talk about why they think it might be time to consider a move to a senior living community. So they are telling us their number one indication or why they are actually now making this decision. So I'll give it a fit. I'll give it a few minutes for, or a few seconds for people to read through the potential options and put in their guesses as to why most people are looking. See some safety downsizing, Jeez, loneliness and isolation I see in there. It's, change. Oh, it's pretty, it's pretty split. It's, everybody's all over the place. All right, so I am getting ready to move on to the answer. Y'all right, it's it's pretty split, but there are a few people that there are there are a few responses that do jump ahead pretty significantly, and that's uh, just curious about their options and concerned about care needs. And what we have here is we broke it out for the people who are looking for themselves versus looking for someone else. And so someone else includes the people looking for their, for their spouse or, uh, or their parents or grandparents or some, or other people that might be involved. Um, and so I'm going to throw, I'm going to throw it to you, you, Scott, when you look at this and I have heard you talk about it a little bit, um, for me, from a marketing standpoint, that just curious about options is not surprising to me. Right. Um, because people hear the the phrase senior living or, or nursing home or other words that indicate the this communal setting where seniors live and they get curious, but they're not really sure, they're not far enough along in their decision making process. Um, when you look at this, what what jumps out at you? So the first thing that kind of jumps out at me is that the market still sees us as a clinical um, option. And, and that's really what it is. They're not seeing us as something like the loneliness or isolation. They're not seeing us as, as a solve for other things other than that clinical. So a change has to happen in, in the market um, to show people that we're more than just that. And so I know one of the topics we're talking about social media, and I think that's how this can be changed is really highlighting some of the really cool things that are happening in a community that aren't clinical, that aren't really um, for, you know, taking care of somebody, but it's for a better quality of life. So one of the things I always try to talk about with our, our team at Five Star is one of the ROIs for a prospective resident or for a resident moving in is that we should make their world bigger, not smaller. Mm -hmm. If they come into our community and their world gets smaller, then we're not doing our job correctly. Um, we should be able to take someone who maybe is isolated in their home and 
introduce them to all new things or connect them to things that they may have lost, whether that's, you know, through outings and things and, and, you know, just bringing in guest speakers and, you know, partnerships with universities. Um, that's what we need to be doing. You can see right now the market is telling us that people are more concerned about the health side of things. Um, we have to change that narrative. Um, and because there is such a value in that loneliness side of things. And it'll be curious to see after a year and a half of a pandemic, does a year from now, does this shift as people are more concerned about that than they were before? But that, that's what stands out to me right now. I will add into that. So this is something that we've been, we've been looking at since, uh, well, well before March of 2020. And uh, we have seen um, with the, the rise of COVID back in 2020 that the concern about loneliness and isolation has increased. There are more people selecting more of the, I wanna be part of a community. I wanna be around other people like myself. I, I don't want to be home by myself. Um, that, it, that has increased. I, I believe it was by a, it, it was by enough percentage that we noticed it internally that that is an increase. I, if, if anyone's curious about the percentage increase, I'm happy to ask my team and get that for you. I just don't have it off the top of my head. But um, if anybody wants it, I'm happy to get it for you. And, and really, you know, one of the one of the I see some of these questions like, how do we change that mindset or how do we look at that? And it, it's really like part of it is like, again, it comes from the very beginning. And, and so if you're looking at an IO, we have to be investing in amenities, right? What kind of amenities are we offering that you're going to get? How do we make this more of a um, you know, whether it's, if it's a high-end building, this luxurious living style, like how do we make things with the concierge and all those and the, and the transportation and different technologies that we use to make that come to the life. Um, in, in some of our maybe maybe not as exclusive communities or high-end communities, but it's, it's about programming. It's about keeping a busy schedule. It's about options. Um, the one thing that we've really struggled with in senior living is that we're still under that mindset of a generation that had three channels to choose from. And we're seeing that that's not the generation that's coming in. They have higher expectations and are used to choice. And so um, we have to build that into our culture. We have to build that into how a building is designed, how we program all of those things. I would just like to add, I think the thing that sticks out to me a little bit is the worried about loneliness and isolation and self scored less than others. Because I think one thing we learned during the pandemic was, residents are a lot more resilient than we thought they were. Like they are now using technology. They now know how to do a lot of things that we didn't think they'd be able to do. And that was a big struggle, right? Like how are we gonna have to get the older, older residents to get up and get you know integrated with the younger, older residents? And now that that happened, they are more resilient. And you know I think that they're a little more open to finding their own form of entertainment and not looking at us to entertain them like they know how to to you know residents are now doing artwork in their apartments maybe they're accessing youtube more and taught themselves how to paint so i think they've become i think we got in that role a little bit of oh we have to entertain everyone and make sure that we're keeping them busy all day long but that's not really what engagement is. We're engaging them in their lives to find things that they're enjoying and then pursue that on their own. So I think maybe sometimes we all think they feel a little more isolated than they do and that they are a little more resilient than we give them credit for. Yeah, and, I, and I, you're 100% right. I think that's, that's a great observation on these numbers um, as well. And I look at it and I say, you know, that's why one of the things I'm really trying to to push, I think the industry needs to look at is, is how do we create more resident led programming? So operationally, it's not gonna be possible for us to add uh, a lot of new staff to create, you know, three or four programs at the same time and, and go from five programs a day to 20 different options. You have to utilize the skill set of the residents that are living in the community. And so, you know, when we start to look at those types of things it's saying, how do we get the, you know, take that information and that knowledge and that passion that our residents have, and then how do we help them kind of create uh, programming that they're going to be able to run, lead and enjoy. We see it happening. You'll see bridge clubs and, and Mahjong clubs and, you know, you know, you, a lot of different clubs coming. We need to continue to, to expand on that and give them the resources to do that because we don't have the bandwidth um, to create, you know, 15, 20 programs a day, but it ultimately is where we need to go. So it's really changing the mindset us and, and asking more of the resident and, and really leaning on those residents that have that skill set to um, lead in the building. And, and that's where they're going to find their purpose. And, and that's the other thing that we're really struggling with is purpose. 
All right, moving on to the next question. So what we did here, and this, this came out of a conversation that Chris and Scott and I had on Friday, which was I wanted to kind of pull out a subset of what I had just showed you and only show you the folks who told us in the beginning who they were doing this assessment for. Um, if you remember, we asked the question, who are you doing this assessment for? They can select myself, mom, dad, others. Um, and so I really wanted to look at people that were looking for a spouse because one of the things that I've heard it, from sales directors and, and marketing, which is when I hear that somebody is looking to move with a spouse, uh, there, there are some things that are, are predictable. And so I wanted to see how did their reasons for, for making a change differ potentially um, from the general population. And so the outcome of this one is obviously still care, curious about their options. We're never going to get rid of that. There's a lot of curiosity, um, but it care needs again was still very high. So one of the things that, that a, a conversation I was having with a client was um, I had pulled this for their specific community. Now, now they are very AL memory care focused. And I, I pulled this same report and a hundred percent selected care needs and concerned about safety. And so my theory here was if somebody's looking with a spouse or a partner that they are that one of that one of them is not doing so great. Um, and so this this does kind of address it a little bit. Um, but I'm curious to hear hear thoughts from from Chris uh, when you look at this. Is this surprising or is this kind of what you had expected? That's what I would expect. Um, you know, they're definitely looking for care needs. But again, I think it goes back to this is where we might be able to make a shift because if the caregiver is planning to move in with a loved one that needs more care needs, then they can build their, their lifestyle up as they move in. So they're going to help themselves be more independent. They're going to allow their loved one to be cared for as they need. And it's actually a win-win for everyone. They get to come in and experience it. They're not feeling lonely or isolated because as a caregiver, you become very lonely and isolated. And, um, you know, it just, it works well. It helps people see that their loved one gets what they need and they get what they need. And then the loved one will probably get a little better because the caregiver isn't the only person they're exposed to. Yeah, do you have anything to add on that before I, I move on? Yeah, no, I mean, I, actually the, the downsizing one, it, that kind of stands out a little bit too, which is, I mean, I think that, that really works well for what we're trying to say, which is, you know, stress-free living, right? That's one of the values that we can add to you um, as a, as you know, from a provider side is going, hey, we're going to help take care of the stress that you have right now trying to care for a home. Um, and, and those probably go hand in hand, right? If, if, you know, the care needs go up, right? It's, it's more important to downsize because you can't take care of the home you're in. But again, one of the things that people struggle with is I, I really try to get rid of all, I have all of this. I'm going to move into this small 250, 300, 400 square foot apartment. Right. And, and so, um, you know, it's really a, a good thing to be able to talk about that in your communities. You're not going down to a 400 square foot apartment. You now have a 60, hundred thousand square foot place that is yours, right. That you have access to. And that's, you know, another piece of this that, you know, not really on this slide, but it's just as a, we have to get better at that is creating environments that our residents want to be in, not that just look aesthetic, aesthetically pleasing, but really create places that you do that, that third space living option, right? Like how Starbucks has become a place that people will just work out of and hang out of. Like, how do we create more of those type of places in our communities that get residents out of their room, that make it feel like I'm not in this small apartment, I'm actually in this, this large living space. Mm -hmm. Do you have something to add? I was just listening, looking at Jill's Jill's response and maintain affordability. I think that that's really true. I think that goes along with with a lot of people's decisions. I think they move into senior living later and later and later because it's it's less expensive to stay home and maybe get help. But if, you know, I think, again, it goes back to when they see that life gets better, when they move to a community because of all of the different things that are offered, that it's, you know, it's worth that. But the, you know, the expense is, is high. We all know that. 
All right. So the next question for everybody to start putting their 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 guesses in. Uh, the question is: Are you aware of of changes in your mom's memory and thinking? Keep in mind that this is showing your moms, but this is also asking the people who were looking for themselves. So there are people who said, "Hey, it would." Basically, the question would say, "Are you aware? Are you aware of changes in your memory and thinking?" So there is that factored in as well. So go ahead and put in your guesses. See a lot of yeses, small change. Yep, I see, see a lot of yes. All right, so I'll give it just two more seconds. A lot of yeses. <laughs> All right, so here's here's the breakout. Um, the number one selected is none that I'm aware of, um, which I, I'm not over, when I look at this, I'm not overly surprised because you remember 49% of the people who completed this uh, assessment were people looking for themselves. Um, it may be hard to admit that there are declines. So this may be a, a jaded view, a uh, rose colored glasses view. <laughs> um, so keep that in mind there, that, that what they're saying here may not actually be representative of where they actually are. This is, this is from one person's perspective, just a lot of them. Um, but there, there are a lot of people that 31% said that there are some small changes. What that means, I have no idea. That is up for you, for, for you all to have those conversations and dig in. I'm, I'm curious when you look at this, uh, Scott, what are, what are some of the thoughts that come to mind and kind of how can you use this information um, once they do become a resident? Well, I, I think what it shows us is that, you know, when you have none that I'm aware of, so again, we have the, the, the perspective of who's answering this, but it's also that our, our residents or even prospective residents are really good at hiding things. And so, you know, if I don't live with mom or dad, or I don't see them every single day, I might not notice these changes. Um, these changes are probably happening at a much higher percentage than what we're seeing on this chart. And they've created ways to overcome that, or they start to, they know it is happening, they don't want to admit it, and they start to socially isolate. And so we see it inside a community as much as we see it outside. As somebody moves in, they actually are having cognitive decline, and we see a drop in attendance and, or participation in programming because they are embarrassed by the change that's happening. So. Um, Looking at these numbers, um, it doesn't surprise me because of one, who the audience is, but two, because I think um, people are good at hiding their symptoms, but we will see modifications to their behavior if they're having cognitive decline. They are going to be less social than before. It's something for us in a community to be very aware of. Um, it's also a struggle, I think, for every single operator, which is you, you can go into a community and, and you will have um, your, your activity professionals tell you, Programming is really hard because the cognitive variability I have is tremendous. I have very, very high functioning residents and I have four residents here that should be living in memory care, but family refuses to move them in, right? And so how do you program? How do you do things for people at, on this large spectrum of the cognitive, kind of this cognitive spectrum? So I think this is a major, major um, issue in communities um, is just figuring out how to do this and put people in the appropriate level of care. Yeah. I would, I would say that I'm not surprised at all by that number, and I'm going to go a little different route if it's the child answering this question. I think a lot of them are in denial because they remember mom the way mom used to be, and um, it's very, very hard to look at reality. So you'll have a lot of daughters, sons saying, you know, my, my dad is fine. He could live in independent living and then they move in and really, truly, they need to live in a memory care neighborhood or close to it. Um, I think, too, it goes back to resiliency. I think a lot of times, you know, kids have trouble making that decision because they don't think mom or dad are going to do well. And I think that we don't realize that they are resilient and sometimes they can do more than we think they can. And just giving them the opportunity and not pushing it, like letting people make choices slowly and slowly move in, I think is, is a really good thing. But I'm not surprised at all about that kids think that there's not a lot of decline in their loved one. Well, and, and Evan, I, there's a great comment. I think it was Jack uh, put it in there that, that, you know, you see the increase in calls after the holidays. So it'd be really interesting to look to see how that data yeah. varies based on, you know, times when families gather. So if this, with this pie chart shift, you know, in January, <laughs> after people have just been together for the holidays, or even in December and January, then it does the rest of the year. Because a lot of times it's my perception versus I've actually experienced the reality. 
Yep. And we, you know, we take a lot of times in our, a lot of time in our communities to self-evaluate. So, you know, we're always trying to program for the majority, but that majority changes. So, you know, you may have very high functioning residents and then as time moves on and we age in place and cognitive decline that changes. So you'll see that. And, and like Scott said, they're very good at covering and their friends are very good at covering for them because nobody wants to share that cognitive decline. I, I just made a note, Scott, to, uh, to go back to my team and pull a January to February report so that we can see how this, how this comes back for that month. So I will, uh, uh, for Megan, I will include that in my follow-up. So I'll add that into the deck for you so that everybody has that. So uh, good points. All right, uh, next question, which is readiness. So how ready are they to make a change? Um, so if everyone uh, wants to place their guesses on the number one selected, um, so whether she's moved, uh, lived in the same place her entire adult life, whether it's been many years since she's moved or if she's moved within the last few years, or I'll give it a second. And I know I'm, I am looking at the time, so I'm gonna not give as much time. All right. Here is the breakouts. So 49% uh, said that it's been many years since they've moved. Um, and then 38 said moved within the last few years. Uh, Chris, when you when you look at this, how, how from a, I guess from a sales and marketing perspective, and I guess it does come over even, even once they do make the decision to move into a community, this is still, I would imagine still in the back of their mind of missing where they were or um, th this decision to move into a new place is difficult. It's, it's not something that once they have decided, it goes away. No. Um, I'm curious to hear what you all do do on that. I don't think, I mean, I'm talking from a mom and raising my kids in my home to have to move out. I mean, if you just take, close your eyes for a minute and think about all the things that mean something in your house right now, your home, what makes it feel like a home and having to decide what to take with you and what not to. And I think sometimes, you know, looking at it from a sales piece, kids want to make everything new and great and wow, this is going to be so nice. And they buy them new furniture and new bedding and everything's new. So then they move into this new home that doesn't feel like home anymore because all the things that they love might not have accompanied them along the journey. So I, I think we forget that sometimes that um, new is great. And I think the younger we are, the more we love that new, but, you know, to take someone who, who's lived in their home with their husband or wife and raised their children, that home means a whole lot. And to take, you know, to put them somewhere new is, is very hard. And, and then to have new, new things on top of it is just very, you know, it can cause depression and a lot of different things. So I think we need to remember that, that memories are more important than new things sometimes. Yeah, it's a great point. I think when we look at it, there is like a, there's a mourning process that happens with someone who's lived in the same home for many years. There is, a, there's a loss and we need to honor that and understand that. I don't think it's something that's really gets down to the building very often, right? So it's something that sales figure has, or they may know or may not know. Uh, but in a community, that is a, that's a good indicator for us to know how are those first couple of days going to, going to be? Is Are they mourning the loss of, of a lot of different things? And so that may be different if I've moved a couple of times recently, I've been downsizing over time and I'm not leaving the family home. Um, so that's, that's the other piece. And the, and the second piece to me is for those, let's just say 50% have not, have not moved in a long time. What is our process then for moving a new resident in? Have we created a process to make them feel at, you know, feel comfortable? Um, think about, I'm a military brat. So I went to a new high school, a new school every year or two. Like there was nothing worse than the very first day of school when you're a new student going, where am I going to sit for lunch? And mm -hmm. our, our new residents experience that at an age that they, you know, at a very like an advanced age. So it's, it's a very, it can be a traumatic thing. And so have we put things in place in our communities to ensure they don't, they don't struggle with that. Um, and so looking at 50% of our residents moving in, haven't moved for a long, long time. This is going to be, uh, it's, we want to build up excitement and make it fun and all those things. At the same time, we have to understand that they're coming, they are, they're experiencing some form of loss or trauma. So it's a great indicator for us that we probably don't know currently. It kind of takes you back to your first day of college 
Yeah. When, you know, you move into the dorm and you don't know anyone and thank God there's an RA who can kind of show you the ropes and show you around. So, you know, those resident ambassadors are so important to help them, you know, invite them to things and encourage them to participate, sit with them at dinner. All right. Next one. Uh, this is probably something that you all never get to deal with, which is families potentially disagreeing on this topic. <laughs> Um, so I thought this would be a fun one to talk about, uh, because I would imagine even after they move in that there are still probably some voices around the outskirts, uh, that may have disagreed. Um, and so we had asked, uh, the, in the question, um, basically if there's any other family members helping with the decision. So, uh, I see some guesses already and I haven't even asked for it. So we are good. We all are getting the drill. Um, I see some yes, having a hard time. No, I see a lot of no's. All right, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna show the responses. 38% uh, said that they are handling the decision on their own, while 41% said that everybody is on the same page and luckily only 10% are having a hard time agreeing. Um, when I saw that, I was actually surprised that it was only 10%, um, but again, you all are on the front line. So it seems like what you all had guessed were, were, were spot on. Um, I Scott, when you look at this, kind of what, what are some things we this probably doesn't need a whole lot of talking since we're all kind of on the same page, but I'm curious kind of initial thoughts on this. Yeah. I mean, I think it's not surprising. I mean, maybe that hard time, that, that number probably changes as the level of care increases. Um, and so that, or, you know, as you know, money gets a little bit tighter as they've been there a little bit longer, I think that number is going to always be fluctuating at a starting point. We might all agree that yes, we want to move mom in somewhere, but then when we start to get into costs and paying for it and, selling a home and all of those, I think that number probably increases. Uh, you're catching this number at a very early stage in the process. So as the process goes on, you may see that number increase. But um, ultimately, I think what we see most of the time is you have kind of that ally in the family. Uh, they're the ones that are the most involved, that they're visiting the most, and that's the one we communicate. Um, and that there might be some peripheral things, but it, you know, it's usually we, we, we find that one primary person that we're communicating with. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. All right, we'll move on to the next one. Uh, this was this was a, a fun one that I I took back to my team after our conversation on Friday because you all gave a slightly different perceptibleness than I had ever really thought of. Um, whether or not she has any trouble walking uh, or just the mobility. Um, and so I see some guesses coming in. Sometimes, sometimes I see a lot of yes and sometimes. Um, the breakout is 40, 43% said that there's no trouble. There's 30% said that there's some trouble. Um, 23 said that they're, they are a fall risk. Um, and Scott, you gave a, and I think, I think both of you actually unanimously came to this, con this conclusion. Um, and, and it comes back to, there's all this data that's gathered in the sales process that's that's living in the CRM, but sometimes doesn't make it over with the resident when they move in. And this was one that jumped out because I had never thought of it because I, I don't think about this the way you all do. Um, but what can this data ultimately do to make that first day an ongoing life at a, one of your communities yeah. easier, more engaged? Um, I mean, can you just share what you what you had thought of as soon as you saw this? Yeah. So the first thing that came to mind is this living in the sales world, but you know, are we using this data to, to help them select a room? Um, you know, if you're going to have trouble with walking and we put you on the fifth floor in the upper wing corner and all programming and dining is everything happening on the first floor, we've really just created an obstacle for you to, to engage in the community. So really looking at this going, going, where is the, where is the primary life of your community? And are people who struggle with walking living near that? Um, now, we don't want to make it so easy from all the time, but we can know that I don't want to take a 15 minute walk to come to a program that lasts 30 minutes and then walk all the way back to my room and then have to come back an hour later. Uh, we really want to make that as easy as possible for people. So, really looking at room decisions and where someone's living based on this. And then, long term, really going, can we do that based on interests? So, looking at going, can we not just always base everything on the physical? part of the building by saying, I know you would really get along with these three people. And I think if you live nearby, that's going to really improve your quality of life because you're going to interact mostly with your neighbors. Um, and so not, not always the view out the window and all of those things, but really going, 
how would your quality of life increase based on where we where your room is? And so I, I would love to have this data go further than just the move-in process, but actually the room selection process. I agree. And I think, um, you know, to go along with that, another thing, you know, where your rooms are, a lot of residents base what they participate in on where the bathroom is located. And, you know, if it's far from where they're engaging, a lot of times they won't come because it's too far of a walk, they're afraid of falling. And we saw an uptick in participation during hallway activities during COVID because people could come outside their door and participate and still be close to a bathroom. So, you know, I agree with Scott, you know, strategically placing people near people that they think that they would get along with, but, you know, really looking at the building itself and where bathrooms are placed and where we're, we're engaging as well, I think is really important. Now we get to the, to the, to the fun stuff. They're going to be telling us what their most, uh, what activities that they, they enjoy. I'm, if we want to guess we can, um, but as you can probably imagine, it is pretty evenly broken out. Um, this, the way I kind of look at this from kind of how it would be helpful for you all uh, from the resident engagement side is knowing their interests uh, once they have agreed to move in. Um, and uh, so Scott, Chris um, takes uh, on kind of what you could do with this, not necessarily the breakout of it, but um, what you could do with this information and, and um, how you can make kind of that the first week or so really impactful for residents. I think this is good information, but if it's if it's completed by the loved one, this might be about mom 20 years ago when I knew mom. So I think it's great as a starting point, but I also think that it's really very important for the engagement team or, you know, to meet with this person and find out who this person is now so that we can really tailor their experience to be very individualized and who they are today. Cool. Yeah, again, it, we're shifting. This generation that's that's looking at senior living now has always had choice. And so we're going to have to have more and more things available to them. And it's not going to be about getting a group of 20 to 30 together. It's going to be around finding three to five, seven people who have very similar interests and creating on-ramps to connections for them. Um, it, it's, you know, the question that I want to ask when a resident moves in, like I, I would love to replace uh, all of the resident satisfaction surveys with just one question. And it's, do you have a close friend living in this community? Uh, because I believe if the answer is yes, you will see move outs drop, you will see it, happiness go up. It's not about keeping them busy, it's about creating a, a meaningful connection with other people. And if they have that, then we've been successful. If we haven't, um, then we're struggling and we need to figure it out. But understanding who they are will help us bring those two people together or that three or four people together because they've some of them have lost us that skill of how do I make a new friend? Um, and so the more information we have about who a person is and what, what they're passionate about, the easier it is for us to build connections for people, which will ultimately lead to people being happier and less load on us. If you have good friends and you're hanging out and you're playing cards together, you don't rely on the team at the community to do, to provide all entertainment for you. Absolutely correct. I know we are, we are coming up on time. The last thing I want to share, I do not have it in this slide. We do ask at the end of our, all of our assessments, what option do you think makes the most sense for either you or your family member who you're looking for? The three options that they are given is uh, at home with help from a home care agency, at home with, no, with help from family or friends, or a senior living community. 75% of the respondents say a senior living community is what they actually believe makes the most sense. Um, so a vast majority of the people who are going through this truly believe that what you all offer is the right fit. Um, so I, I did want to leave everybody with that. and. Uh, I will end it there um, and hand it back to Megan. Thank you so much, Evan. If you could just unshare, I'll, I'll just pop up a couple slides here. Chris, Scott, Evan, thank you so much for your time today. I know that we don't have time for questions, but I am happy to put up some contact information for folks here. So any questions about today's presentation, you can reach Evan and Charles here through the email. And as we said, we will send out a PDF of today's presentation deck so everyone can download that great data. And Charles has been dropping in the chat box today a link to our co-branded tip sheet that we did on how to leverage technology and social media. 
So you can find a link to that, as well as a contest that we are currently running for our Old People Are Cool initiative. If you want to go ahead and submit your artwork to that by April 19th, win some Old People Are Cool stickers. We are also holding our first ever uh, customer summit exclusive for Link Senior customers and partners on May 3rd. Very exciting. And we have our Activity Strong upcoming events calendar. So you can find all of our upcoming events and registration links here. And just as save the date for our virtual summit, that's going to be six sessions long. So up to six continuing education credits that day on June 21st. So Charles will put the link in the chat box for that. And we hope to see you there. So Chris, Scott, Evan, thank you again. And we'll look forward to seeing everyone for the April 26th webinar uh, later this month. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for listening to the Activity Strong Executive Edition series powered by Link Senior. Find more resources and webinar information at btgvoice.com.